This video is sponsored by SeatGeek. MLB is back, and if you're itching to get back out to the ballpark, SeatGeek has you covered. Whether it's baseball, football, basketball, or live music, SeatGeek puts tickets from all over the web in one place to make buying simple. In fact, I used their service for World Series tickets last year. We all like getting a good deal, and SeatGeek makes it easy to score. Just look for the colored dots which rate the ticket value on a scale of 1 to 10. Green means go. You can also see what your view will look like before purchasing. If that all sounds fine and dandy, you can use code FOOLISH for $20 off your first purchase at SeatGeek. You can do it from your computer, or if you're on mobile, click the link in the description to download the app. Once again, use code FOOLISH for $20 off your first purchase. Thank you to SeatGeek for sponsoring this video. September 29th, 2019. Pitching in relief, Corbin Burns takes the mound in the eighth inning to face Dom Nunez of the Rockies. Ball one. It's been a difficult season for Burns, who opened the year in the Brewers' rotation, but spent the majority of his summer in AAA San Antonio. And it's about to get worse. Corbin Burns remains out there. High five ball, deep right field, take it to the Here come the Rockies late again. This second deck homer in his final appearance inflates his season ERA to 8.82, the worst in the National League by any pitcher with at least 40 innings that season. Just two short years later, he'd grab a Cy Young award after a dominant 2021 campaign. But make no mistake, this isn't a story about how the worst pitcher suddenly became the best. This is about what happens when raw talent is willing to make the right adjustments. Corbin Burns might have been the National League's worst pitcher by ERA in 2019, but certainly not by true talent. With a smaller sample size, it would make sense to analyze his peripheral numbers. Fielding independent pitching is an ERA estimator that takes defense out of the equation by only examining strikeouts, walks, and home runs, and it's better at predicting future ERA than past ERA. Burns pumped out an impressive strikeout rate, all while keeping his walks at a reasonable level, but he allowed 17 home runs in 49 innings to give him a FIP just north of 6. That's better than his 8.82 ERA, but still awful. Let's dig deeper on those home runs. In 2019, the league average home run to fly ball rate was 15.3%. Given this was the peak of the juice ball era, that's the highest on record. But Corbin Burns? 38.6% of fly balls surrendered by Corbin Burns left the ballpark, which is easily the worst rate in the last 20 years, and a rate so high that no pitcher, no matter how bad, would be able to sustain it over a larger sample size. And sure, there were plenty of no-doubters, but also some wall scrapers, like this 95 mile per hour exit velocity job from Jason Hayward. Fly ball luck necessitated the creation of XFIP, a version of FIP which normalizes home run to fly ball rate to the league average. And thus, Corbin Burns, with his 8.82 ERA, had a 3.37 XFIP. A lot of his transformation into a Cy Young winner can be explained by regression to the mean. After all, he had the pedigree. Burns was a consensus top 100 prospect who quickly chewed through the minor leagues, making his debut in 2018 just two years after he was drafted. And while his four-seam fastball got crushed in 2019, his slider was already among the league's best. His swinging strike rate on that pitch was tops in MLB, beating out elite relievers like Liam Hendricks and elite starters like Max Scherzer. But his four-seam fastball was a huge red flag, with batters slugging over 800 against the heater. It had good velocity, so it must have just had a pretty terrible spin rate, right? Right? Wait, what? How could Corbin Burns throw the highest spin rate fastball in the league and still get hammered? Spin gives the pitch movement, right? In terms of velocity and RPMs, Burns' four seam compared favorably to that of Justin Verlander, who won the AL Cy Young that year. A standard four seam fastball relies on the Magnus effect to get swings and misses. The pitch is thrown with backspin, which allows the ball to fight against the force of gravity. This is where the term rising fastball comes from. 
the ball doesn't actually rise, it just doesn't fall as much as the batter would expect. According to the StatCast leaderboards, Verlander's fastball only had 10.7 inches of drop in 2019, which was best among starting pitchers. Yet Burns, with a higher velocity and spin rate, somehow threw a flat, hittable fastball that dropped 16.6 inches. That's a difference of half a foot, which could easily be the difference between a bad whiff and a monster home run. Elite spin rate is good, but as Burns demonstrated, it doesn't always lead to elite movement. An explanation for this discrepancy can be found in the concept of spin efficiency, otherwise known as active spin. Active spin is a measure of the aforementioned Magnus effect, and the Magnus effect only applies to pitches thrown with backspin or topspin, like forcing fastballs and curveballs. Justin Verlander, ever the poster boy, led the league with a spin efficiency of 98.5%. This means basically all of his spin was going into moving his fastball using the Magnus effect. Corbin Burns, on the other hand, had a spin efficiency of just 58.5%. His spin rate wasn't being used to its full potential. So if just over half his spin was active, what does inactive spin look like? You can certainly visualize a looping Rich Hill curve thrown with topspin, but that isn't the only way to throw a ball. Imagine a baseball thrown like a football with a tight spiral around one point. The football doesn't move in the air, it flies straight as an arrow. This is called gyrospin, and it doesn't move the baseball on its own. But as the ball travels, some of that gyro spin is eventually converted into what's called side spin. A sudden influx of side spin around the plate creates late, sharp movement on a pitch that initially appeared to be going straight. A good example of this would be Luis Castillo's slider, which is thrown with a lot of spin, but not a lot of spin efficiency. It's almost all gyro. In the case of Corbin Burns, his Magnus spin and gyro spin were canceling each other out, leading to very little movement at all. But there is a way to make those two forces work in tandem. With a very minor adjustment, his cutter was born. Burns is equal parts humble and coy when describing the process of converting his bad four-seamer into his good cutter. He notes a few adjustments to the ball's position in his hand, but the intent hasn't changed. You know, when, when I go out there and I'm trying to throw it, I'm thinking through the process of just trying to throw a forcing fastball. With a few tweaks here and there and a few adjustments with the ball position in the hand, we kind of unlock this pitch. The graph of his fastball usage over the years is fascinating. In 2019, he was all four seam. In 2020, he had an even split between cutter and sinker. And in 2021 and beyond, he's primarily just using the cutter. 2020 was of course the precursor to overwhelming success the following year. Burns put together a 2.11 ERA in 59 innings of shortened season baseball, finishing 6th in Cy Young voting. With the cutter-sinker combo, he dropped his ERA by 6.7 runs, the second largest improvement in MLB history, trailing only the legendary Roy Halladay. The sinker alone could have been a huge boost for Burns. It had the same drop as his four seam, but 10 more inches of horizontal movement. In the fraction of a second a hitter has to make a swing decision, spin and velocity are clues to determining where the ball is going and when it'll get there. There's an element of anticipation as well, like expecting a first pitch fastball or a breaking ball in the dirt on an 0-2 count, but in a vacuum, they just hope to pick up on spin and velocity even if it's all done in the subconscious. As Mookie Betts once said, you try to read the spin, but the way I do it, I have no idea. Yet, the difference between a Corbin Burns cutter and sinker is illegible, because not only are their differences in velocity and spin rate imperceptible to the human eye, they also spin along virtually the same axis while moving in very different directions. The sinker, of course, has arm side run, whereas the cutter has that late gyro side spin cut. Now again, these pitches have the same velocity, same spin rate, and same spin direction, but different movement. A good stat to demonstrate the sheer dominance of Corbin's cutter would be called strikes plus whiffs percentage, aka a sabermetric way of saying that strikes are good. Since 2020, it leads all fastballs in CSW percentage, beating out the best heaters from pitchers like Hayter and DeGrom. 
and even if the batter hits the ball, the introduction of the cutter slash burns his barrel rate in half, then did it again. It's just a great blend of weak contact and whiffs. In fact, his 117 cutter strikeouts in 2021 are an MLB record during the pitch tracking era. When you think of the cut fastball, there's a couple relievers that jump to mind. One of them is Mariano Rivera, who almost exclusively threw a cutter en route to becoming the greatest reliever of all time. The other is Kenley Jansen, who led all relievers in F4 from 2011 to 2017 with an 85% cutter usage rate. If you're going to rely on one pitch, the cutter seems to be a good choice. Burns' offering is ultimately much more comparable to Jansen's. In terms of vertical movement, Rivera's cutter had a lot of drop relative to other fastballs, leading to weak contact, broken bats, and ground balls. Whereas Burns and Jansen have less drop than expected, leading to swings and misses. Yet, Burns and Rivera do share a similar road to Damascus moment. Rivera describes the sudden appearance of his cutting action in 1997 as a gift from God. Burns, meanwhile, pursued a cutter simply because it just kind of dawned on me one day. In 2019, his four-seam fastball was 1,216th in run value, tied for last place with plus 24, meaning teams added 24 more runs on him than the average fastball. Just two years later, his cutter was the eighth most valuable pitch in the league. The ratios in strikeouts, walks, and home runs were just plain silly. Burns had about 7 strikeouts per walk and 33 per home run. In terms of FIP, it was the second best qualified season in the live ball era, trailing only the legendary 1999 campaign of Pedro Martinez. And the source of all this success? A change in fastball usage that looks radical in graph form, but really only amounts to, as Burns said, a few tweaks here and there and a few adjustments with the ball position in his hand. This says a lot about baseball, a sport where honing the right pitch or making the right swing adjustment can be the difference between major league stardom and minor league burnout. As massively talented as Burns is, there have been others before him that simply never figured it out. Perhaps the real star of the story is his dreadfully unlucky 2019 season, which saw a 3.37 xFIP turn into an 8.82 ERA. Burns could have simply looked at the advanced numbers, brushed it off as a bad break, and returned to spring training as a forcing fastballer. After all, he had plenty of success with that pitch throughout the minors and in his 2018 rookie year. Instead, he used his misfortune as inspiration to do something different, and it has made him one of the absolute top pitchers in the league right now. And the beauty of the data age is we can see exactly how it happened. The advanced metrics revealing his true talent, the reasoning behind the cutter, the drastic change in pitch mix, the different types of spin-induced movement. It's all there to consume thanks to technology that wasn't even in use a decade ago. Hitters are privy to this information as well. They step in the batter's box knowing exactly what Corbin Burns has up his sleeve. They just can't hit it. Big thank you to William Cage for the music.